Hey guys, and welcome to a new video, and actually the first video in our new series called Everything You Need to Know About, where we take technical terms and fully break them down for you so you can understand them better and do better on your career. Welcome back to the Dion Training channel, where we help you get certified, pass certification exams, and do better on your career. In this episode, we are going to be talking about DNS. If you've ever used a computer before, you've probably heard or seen the term DNS. Maybe you were trying to reach a specific website Website, but you were met with this kind of error, or perhaps this one. But what does DNS actually mean? DNS stands for Domain Name System. See, computers are not really good when dealing with letters. As you might know, they only know two numbers, one and zero, but they are really good at those two numbers. However, when it comes to us humans, we are much better with letters and words than we are with numbers. For example, it is way easier for me to tell you to visit my website at I love dns.com than to tell you to go to 69.240.11.54. It is just much easier that way. So we had to figure out a way for the computers to understand and correlate the letters and words that we love to the IP addresses and the numbers that they love, just to make sure everyone is happy and they don't rebel on us and destroy humanity. Thankfully, a really smart fellow called Paul Petrus took it up to himself and actually came up with DNS in the year 1983. And that that's where DNS comes. The domain name system protocol is used to help our devices find a website on the internet using a human readable name. The way DNS works is pretty simple. If you type lego.com in your address bar so you can snag an exclusive expert creator Titanic set, your computer will then reach out to the very knowledgeable DNS server and politely ask them, you know this guy? The DNS server will then reply back to your computer and tell them, oh yeah, Lego.com is actually 2.16.6.11. Your computer will then use that IP address to navigate to the website. All of this happens in mere milliseconds in the backgrounds of our computer network infrastructure. Right now, you might be asking yourself, I don't have a DNS server at my house. In fact, I don't have any servers. How is my computer doing that? Well, the answer is pretty simple. You are most likely using your ISPs or internet service providers provided DNS servers. However, if you ever worked at a big company that has a dedicated corporate network, then you might have been using a dedicated DNS server. It just makes more sense that way. I want you to think of DNS as the way contacts work on your phone. If you want to call someone, you don't write their number on a piece of paper and keep it on you all the time. You simply save the contact one time, and if you want to call them, you go into your contacts, you look for their name, and then you press on it, and boom, you call them. That's it. All DNS does is convert names to numbers and numbers to names. But wait a minute, there must be more to this than just that. Well, yes and no. While this is the gist of DNS, simply, there are a few more concepts that you should be familiar with. One of those concepts is FQDNs, or Fully Qualified Domain Names. An FQDN is the complete address of a website, which consists of three parts. The subdomain, the domain of the website itself, and the top-level domain. Now, your domain is your website's name itself, while the subdomain is a small part of your website. For example, my website could be called mazinloveslegos.com. That's my domain name, which is the bigger part of the website. But if you want to go to my file server, you would have to type ftp.mazinloveslegos.com and that directs you to a subdomain or a smaller level of my website. Some common subdomains that you will meet all the time are ftp, www, shop, and admin. Next up is the top level domain, which is always at the end of the address and it represents the type of organization or website. .com is the most common one that you see all the time, which represents commercial websites. But there's also .mil, .edu, .org, and .gov. All right, on to another concept. DNS works in a hierarchical kind of way, where it goes from top to bottom. At the very top, you have your root level. In this level, we have the servers that manage the top level domains. They know where to find your .com, .org, .net, or .gov. We go one step down and we find the top level domains themselves that we spoke of earlier. One more step down the ladder and we find the second level domains. These are the main part of a website's address, like Mazen Loves Legos in MazenLovesLegos.com. You can really tell that I love Legos, don't you? Underneath that, we have the subdomain level. The subdomain level is used to create extra sections or services of the same website. For example, shop.mazenLovesLegos.com. Finally, at the very bottom,
bottom, we have the host level, which is the lowest level in the DNS hierarchy and represents the exact machines or servers themselves. For the lowest of the low! Now, you might have a question popping in your head. You said the DNS was invented in 1983. So what did we do before that? Did we have to memorize all the IP addresses and numbers and just write them down? Well, that is not entirely wrong. Before DNS came to life, we had something called host file. This file contained IP addresses and their corresponding domain names. And it worked in this way. When you attempt to access a website, can you let me in, please? Using a human friendly name, such as www dnsrocks.com, your system will first take a look into the host file located on its local drive. If it finds the corresponding IP address, it will use that information to access the website and totally bypass the DNS system. Host files still exist to this day, and their relationship with the DNS protocol is based on speed and priority. Well, who's faster, Snake or Mongoose? Snake. Your computer will basically try to use the service that is faster and closer. Host files can also be used to annoy people by rerouting the domain name of a specific website to another one. For example, if you know that one of your friends really like to access a specific website, you can replace the domain name for that website with Rick Astley's I'm gonna give you up. I'm gonna let you down. This joke will never die. All right, back to DNS. Inside your DNS server, information is held within records, and there are generally eight types of records that you should know about. These are A records, AAAA -A 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 records, C name records, X records, MX records, PTR records, SOA records, and NS records. A records are used to link a host name to an IPv4 address. AAAA -A 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 records are used to link a host name to an IPv6 address. A C name or a canonical name record is used to make a domain name point to another domain name. So if you want the domain name mazinloveslegos.com to point to another domain called legosrock.com, you can use a canonical name or a C name record to do that. An MX record stands for an email exchange record, and it is used to direct emails to a specific email server and indicate how email messages should be routed and which protocol they should use. Next, we have SOA records, which stands for Start of Authority Record. An SOA record is used to store important information about a domain or a zone, things like the email address of the administrator of the domain or the last time the domain was was updated. PTR records or pointer records are used to point an IP address to a domain name, which is the exact opposite of an A record. A records point names to IBV4 addresses, while pointer records point IBV4 addresses to names. TXT records, also known as text records, are used by administrators to store human readable information inside the DNS. These were designed as a way for us to input human readable information into our DNS records. Finally, we have an NS record, which is a name server record. A name server record is used to state which DNS name server is the authoritative one for this domain. Who's the boss here, huh? This is important because DNS uses a hierarchical system and all the DNS servers need to know which server owns this domain and is allowed to make changes to it. Now, I want to talk to you about some of the most common DNS attacks. We are a cybersecurity channel after all. First, we have DNS cache poisoning, also known as DNS spoofing. This involves corrupting DNS data with false information, often redirecting traffic to malicious websites used by the attackers. Second, we have DNS amplification attacks. In a DNS amplification attack, the attacker exploits the DNS resolution process to overwhelm the target device with DNS traffic. The attacker sends a DNS query with the spoofed IP address of the target device to an open DNS server, which then sends back a large amount of DNS responses overwhelming the target device. Third, we have DNS tunneling. DNS tunneling involves using the DNS protocol to encapsulate non-DNS traffic such as HTTP or SSH over port 53 to try to bypass the organization's firewall rules. Since DNS requests are usually allowed to go through a system's firewall without inspection, attackers usually do this to conduct command and control or C2C or carry out some kind of data exfiltration. It's like dressing up as a Walmart employee, carrying an unlabeled empty box, going inside the store, filling it with goodies, and then walking out just like you work there. As funny as it might 
might be, it's also very clever, if you ask me. Finally, we have DNS zone transfer attacks. In a DNS zone transfer attack, the attacker tries to get a copy of the entire DNS zone data, which includes all the DNS records for a domain. By pretending to be the authorized system making this request, this type of attack can expose a lot of sensitive information about the network infrastructure and could be used as a part of a reconnaissance operation to plan future attacks against this company or organization. All right, guys, this gets us to the end of everything you need to know about DNS. Hit the like button if you like this video. Make sure to subscribe and activate the notification bell so you don't miss the next episode of everything you need to know about. Don't forget to check out deontraining.com for the best cybersecurity and IT training out there. See you in the next one.